In the previous video, we installed an air-to-air -air intercooler on the 719cc supercharged Kubota diesel engine that we installed in our semi-vintage Honda Insight. Well, long story short, we did some basic testing, but we didn't get a chance to do any performance testing. So today, we're going to find out if the intercooler helps or hurts performance. You would think the answer would be obvious, but so far we found other than significantly reducing the temperature of the boosted air, the intercooler doesn't seem to offer any benefits. Now, to make things interesting and to have a little bit of fun, we're going to pit the supercharged diesel Honda against a gasoline electric hybrid Honda in an all-out acceleration battle for championship. All joking aside, the reason we need to do an acceleration test on the supercharged diesel Honda is, we believe the engine is completely maxed out as far as making power, and we're going to have to adjust the fuel rack for a little bit more fuel. But before we can make any adjustments, we need to find out exactly how fast this car really is. Because the next level of upgrades will come in the form of electronics and code. Now, later in the video, we'll have a look at what's in store for this little diesel engine in the upcoming episodes. Let's get started. All right, we've gathered two of the most pathetic cars in the state of Kansas, and the question is, which one will be faster? The supercharged, intercooled 719cc Kubota D722 diesel, or the factory original and somewhat boring gasoline electric hybrid fuel economy king? We'll find out soon enough. So, street racing's illegal even if it's between two of the slowest cars in Kansas. However, accelerating up to highway speeds is perfectly fine. So in this race, we'll be accelerating each car up to highway speeds in individual tests. Then we'll compare the results. Keep in mind, this car is supercharged and this car is not. However, this car does have a dinky electric motor that helps propel it when it accelerates. Could be a close race or maybe not. Both cars are in the staging area and have successfully completed the mandatory single point safety inspection and now the officials have given the green light to proceed with the race of the century. Let's do this. The little diesel engine's warmed up and ready to go. Today is a little warmer and the ambient temp is hovering around 80 degrees Fahrenheit and the air charge temps at the intake manifold are in the mid to upper 90s. Today we're going to do the standard 0 to 55 and then continue accelerating up to 60 so we have some data to compare with the unmodified car. The time to beat is 20.30 seconds for the 0 to 55 and for the 0 to 60, well, I have no idea. Wow, despite the massive change in charge temps, we only saw a very small improvement. Interesting. Now, for the 0 to 60, that's another interesting number. So if you paid attention, I actually continued accelerating well past 60 miles per hour, and that's so I can get an idea when the exhaust gas temperature reached its alarm trigger point, which is set to a safe 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. If the alarm didn't go off, well, I reckon the car could continue accelerating up to the low to mid 70s, which is mathematically possible but unconfirmed at this point. Alright, let's switch cars and see what the unmodified car can do. Up next is the normal car. Uh, yeah, this thing is far from normal in every conceivable way, but for the sake of this video, we're calling this car the normal one. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, this car has a 1 liter gasoline engine and it has an electric assist motor. The electric assist motor on this hybrid provides assistance during acceleration, and that gives this underpowered car a much needed boost in performance. The five-speed gearbox on this car was engineered with the electric assist motor in mind, and this car can accelerate up to 70 miles per hour in second gear. Yeah, if you know anything about gear ratios, well, that means the gearbox on this car is a bit odd, and it takes some getting used to. Although it can accelerate up to 70 in second gear, normally that's not the way you're supposed to drive one of these. Now, for the drag race, we're going to be pulling data from the IMA module so you can see what the electric motor is doing. This is the amperage that the electric motor is drawing from the battery pack. 
This is the motor speed, and since the electric motor is an integral part of the flywheel on the gasoline engine, this is also the engine RPM. And this, of course, is the vehicle speed. And this PID is not accurate, and I'm not sure what the deal is, but this number jumps around a bit, so we won't be using it. The IMA module and the speedometer independently calculate the vehicle speed from the same sensor, but the data from the IMA appears to be less accurate. All right, the last bit of data we'll be looking at is the torque generated by the IMA. This, of course, is in Newton meters, which makes no sense to me. However, for those who are playing along at home, you can stop the video at any time during the acceleration run and use this number and this number to calculate the actual horsepower the electric motor is generating. At the end of the run, I'll grab a snapshot of this data and I'll do the calculations for those who don't want to do the math. Now, according to some data I gleaned from the internet, this car should be able to get up to 60 miles per hour in 11.3 seconds. I find that to be improbable, but let's see how close we can get to that number. Okay, I apologize, the lighting isn't great, and I reckon most of you folks can't see the speedometer, but no worries, it's visible in the video editor, and I can see it. The time to beat is 11.3 seconds when comparing this car to a new Honda Insight, and when comparing it to the diesel Insight, we have to get up to 60 in less than 20 seconds. Let's see what we can do. Well, this car certainly isn't as quick as it's supposed to be, and that could be because it's 25 years old and has enough miles on it to have traveled to the moon. But I reckon it's fast enough because it's looking like it's seven and a half seconds faster than the diesel-powered car up to 55 miles per hour. And for the zero to 60, this fuel miser managed to beat the diesel by a good 10 seconds. I honestly don't think the diesel car will ever beat those numbers, but we can have some fun trying. Now, how much horsepower did the electric motor add during acceleration? Well, this is a snapshot showing the maximum torque the electric motor delivered briefly during the acceleration. And if we do the math, it looks like we had almost 13 horsepower of electrical doodads helping scoot the car down the road. Oh, I converted the Newton meters to pounds feet for my calculations, and I'm not sure how the metric folks deal with these numbers. So you guys are on your own while I unpack this information. So the thing about electric motors is, it's not necessarily the horsepower, it's about the torque. And as you can see, the IMA added about 20 pounds feet of torque at its peak, which really doesn't sound like much. Anyway, clearly this car is faster than the diesel car. And I reckon at some point we need to race the diesel Honda against the Predator-powered Renault. That would be epic. So now that we've gathered our last bit of data, we can move forward and optimize the performance of the diesel engine with some custom electronics and a bit of code. Let's take a look at the high-tech stuff we have developed for our little Kubota engine. Okay, these are the two gizmos that we intend on using to enhance the performance of the little diesel engine. This guy we looked at in a previous video, and this time around we made some major changes to it so the alternator belt wouldn't come in contact with it. And as you can see, we provided a generous amount of room for the belt, and we should be okay. Now on this prototype, I also provided enough room to install aluminum inserts so this part can be firmly bolted to the engine without fear of cracking any of the plastic. I think at this point, I'm ready to print this computer-controlled fuel rack limiter in a stronger ASA plastic. We'll get back to this in a minute. Now this guy is our computer-controlled blow-off valve. Well, actually it's a little bit more than that. This gizmo provides linear control of the boost pressure so we can run any amount of boost we want. Now, just like the fuel rack limiter device, we're using a General Motors idle air control valve, which is actually a bipolar stepper motor when expressed in electronic terms. These holes on the side of this gizmo are vent holes, and they're large enough to allow the boost to be rapidly dumped or lightly vented. Now, this is a 3D printed part, which means it's created from thousands of layers of plastic. In order to ensure that this part doesn't delaminate, we're using fasteners that extend throughout the body of the valve, and that should keep the valve from failing. I'm not sure this is necessary, as 3D printed parts are actually robust, but it can't hurt. In a minute, we'll test this thing on the car, but first, let me give you a close-up view on how it works. Most of the stuff I do on the bench requires temporary connections, and I found these Wago-type connectors from the Jungle site provide a clean and temporary connection 
I'm not affiliated with the Jungle site, I'm just passing along something cool that I found. So if I turn this knob, I can make this linear valve extend and retract. Not too shabby. Oh, I guess I should show you the magic that's involved. Yeah, it takes all this junk to make the valve operate. In a future video, I'll go through exactly how all this stuff works, but basically it's a $12 Arduino and a $15 stepper motor controller plus a 12 volt battery. So yeah, I can control the exact position of this valve with the knob, but that's just for demonstration purposes. In reality, the computer will select the position of the valve depending on driving conditions. So let me bolt this thing together and then we'll test it out on the car. But first, let me show you how the completed rack limit gizmo operates. Now I'm using the exact same code on this guy for the demo, and the code has been slowed down so it's easier to see how stuff moves. In a real application, this gizmo would be significantly faster. Anyway, as you can see, we're able to vary the length of the shaft, and that will provide real-time adjustment of the fuel rack limit. Again, this will eventually be controlled by some clever but simple code for complete automatic operation. All right, let's test the boost control valve on the car. So we're currently using a 12 volt solenoid valve to dump boost at idle, and this works fine. But it's possible we don't really need full boost when cruising at highway speeds, so we're gonna replace this valve with our adjustable gizmo. Fast forward a few minutes and the new valve's installed. The other crap is off camera over here, but we really don't need to be looking at that stuff. All right, let me start the engine so we can see if this gizmo works. So the valve is open right now, and it's venting all the boost the supercharger is generating. If I plug the vent holes, you can hear the supercharger groan a little bit. Alright, let me turn the knob and close the valve electronically. Oh yeah, it's closed. You can hear the supercharger complain. So it feels like it's completely sealed because I don't feel any pressure being vented. Here's a close-up of the valve opening and closing. Keep in mind, the software was written so this stuff moves slowly, but that's for demonstration purposes. So if you didn't know by now, the purpose of this linear valve is so we can dump a small amount of boost at cruising speed and that will decrease the drag the supercharger is putting on the engine and it actually may help with fuel economy. It'll be an interesting experiment when we actually try driving the car with this thing. Let's take a look at how the fuel rack limiter fits our spare engine. So this is the redesigned fuel rack limiter gizmo and like I mentioned earlier, it's been modified to provide clearance for the alternator belt. Now, this M6 bolt with a 3mm hole drilled in the center is taking the place of the fuel rack adjustment thingy, and this bolt allows the rod and our gizmo to pass through the engine block and make contact with the fuel rack. So this guy fits like this, and because it has the metal inserts, it can be snugly tightened to the engine in three places. Let's see how the belt fits. Yeah, there seems to be plenty of room for the belt. I reckon we really need to try this on a running engine, but that ain't happening today. Now, I did get a few comments in the last video about possibly using an idler pulley to deflect the belt, but the problem is the smallest idler pulley that's available is way too big for this tiny engine. So yeah, that isn't going to work. And we can't extend the belt to loop around the gizmo because the belt would come in contact with the lower motor mount, which you can't see because this engine obviously isn't in the car. But I assure you, the lower motor mount on the left side of this engine is a big chunk of steel, and it also supports a hanger bearing for the axle. So this engine's tiny, but on camera, it looks pretty big. Now, according to my YouTube analytics, 55% of the audience has one of these in their pockets. And... 3% of those folks have one of these in their purses. Interesting. Eh, for the metric crowd, this guy is 156 by 66 millimeter. So if I pull the camera back, we can see at the widest point, this tiny engine's only two bucks wide. Yeah, two bucks doesn't buy much these days, but remember, that's at the widest point of this engine. The bulk of this engine is closer to a dollar wide. So yeah, this engine's small, but the Saturn MP3 gearbox that we're using is huge, and that pushes this tiny engine closer to things that get in the way. 
Actually, everything gets in the way on this car, and it's been a nightmare trying to make stuff fit. Hopefully in the next video, we'll have the 3D printed parts printed in ASA plastic so we can actually do some real tests. Now, this is all uncharted territory, and we may actually make some fascinating discoveries. So if you're not already subscribed, please consider doing so, because you won't want to miss any of this stuff. Until next time. We clear in both directions? You gotta love Kansas. I can park two cars in the middle of a busy road and stand here for quite a while to get this shot. Nowhere else. See you folks next time.